see this? Wonderful. So welcome, thank you to our very first ever Ninja Think Tank. This is a new series that we're just starting today uh, to help bring some really deep and meaningful discussion around some key topics that are affecting all of us in the workplace, uh, whether that be the workplace at home or the workplace in the office or wherever we might be. I can see that Kim's just joined us. Hi, Kim, thank you so much for joining. I'm gonna make Kim a co Morning, Julie, morning, everyone. Awesome, thank you, Kim. Wonderful to have you here with us. So this is our first Ninja Think Tank and the very big topic of hybrid working. I'm very excited to have this session with you today. For those that don't know me, my name is Julie Jones. Uh, I am a Productivity Ninja are here at Think Productive. Um, if you'd like to take a screenshot of my details, feel free, but I will contact you after the session with some resources that we'll discuss during our time together. Um, so you'll have my contact details there too. We love this conversation around productivity and wellbeing. So please feel free to get in touch at any time. Uh, Matt, who you probably all know, uh, our head ninja, Matt is unfortunately, or unfortunately, he's actually running a very big workshop uh, with a bunch of directors in Sydney today, so I was unable to make the session. So you have me and Gavin is one of our other ninjas too, so Gavin is going to help support me during this session as well. So please feel free to keep in touch. At Think Productive, we absolutely love helping people to love Mondays. I know that may sound like a crazy vision, but that's what we do. And uh, more now than ever, wherever we work, as ninjas, we are very used to working uh, remotely. Uh, we work a lot from home, uh, but we do also love going into offices and spending time face to face with people as well as with our team. So uh, yeah, we, we are really passionately interested in this topic of hybrid working. I also would love to introduce you to our wonderful panelists today. Uh, Kim Lyon, for, who is the Chief Culture and Communications Officer at Media Brands Australia. Thank you so much, Kim, for joining us. Uh, Kim and uh, Jen, who's the next panellist, who I will just share with you here. Jen is from uh, the Lendy Group and is the Senior Management Manager for Experience and Organisational Development. Thank you so much, Jen and Kim, for joining us today and sharing some of your experiences with us. We're very excited to have you here to sort of get some real meat around the bones. So thank you. I'm going to be throwing to you guys shortly with some questions. First up, I did promise that we'd cover some research and I wanted to share with you some insights from the PwC PricewaterhouseCooper Future of Work research. They are regularly doing um, quite a lot of research in this area and they're very generous in sharing this with us. So I'm going to get into the research. We're going to then have our open mic panel discussion. Um, with Kim and Jen leading that discussion. And if we would like to, if you'd like to ask questions, I'm gonna ask, please pop them in the chat box, um, but we will have a, an opportunity to maybe quiz Jen and Kim a little bit on some of the things that they'll share with us uh, during the session. And we will also have some breakouts at the end where we can really get into some deep and meaningfuls on this. I'm also gonna share with you our best Ninja Hybrid productivity tips, just a few things to help, I guess, broaden the conversation a little bit around how we can start to to implement some change and I would love at the very end session I'm going to ask you to actually think about what action will you take as a result of today we love to be very action oriented helping you to move forward and being productive with this stuff so yeah be prepared for that so take notes as we go and we'll be able to encourage you to do some action planning at the end of the session okay let's get into it so the future of work uh, report from PricewaterhouseCooper, they just issued this about two weeks ago. I'd actually been working um, in pulling this presentation together um, on their old report, which came out a couple of months ago. So they're very regularly updating some of the findings in this area. Uh, and it's really worth having a look at. I'm gonna send you the link. I'll actually pop the link in the chat box right now for you. This is their website where they host uh, some insights as well as the report. Um, and I know Jen did, I'm not sure if anyone else attended, but on Friday they ran a really cool, um, great debate around the topic of hybrid working, which is now available also to view as a recording. So um, I have a copy of that, which I'm hoping the link will work. I will email to all of you afterwards as well. It was a great conversation, wasn't it, Jen? Did you enjoy that conversation? Yeah, it was very cool. I really did. It's always great hearing Don Price speak, so. Yeah, he was a 
absolute powerhouse, wasn't he? It was fantastic. Wonderful. Okay, so I, I've pulled out what I felt were probably my favourite insights from the research and some really powerful, I guess, prompters for us to think about hybrid working. And I'm going to go through these in, in just touching on a little bit of detail with a few of the stats in there as well. So knowing our people, really important to know our people well. And I, I really thought this was one of the very big insights from the day was the beware of averages. So we can look at stats and we can look at numbers, but yeah, beware of those averages. We can't really pigeonhole everyone into the same place. We really need to rethink the role of the office. There was a lot of discussion and debate around this in terms of do we go back to a physical office, as I can see some of us already are, um, or you know the, the flexibility of working from home or anywhere else that's right for us. There was also a lot of discussion on Friday and there's masses of information in the report that I would, would direct you to around creating spaces and ways of working. So new ways of thinking of how to entice people into the office. I've like I've added a little bit of a ninja twist on this. I think our unorthodoxy ninja that we talk a lot about in our workshops is going to be pivotal as we move forward into kind of planning and mapping what we want our new future to look like. And orthodoxy is this ninja that, that focuses around experimentation and play, having some fun here, giving our people the ability to experiment and discover what's the right place for them. So I'll touch on that a little bit too. And very importantly, inspiring our leaders to lead. There's a new need for our leaders to have skills that help them to lead in this new environment. So I'm going to go through those in just a little bit of detail with some stats, as I mentioned. I'll go through this pretty quickly so we can get into our discussion. Very interestingly, the research, obviously pre-COVID, we can see uh, the stats here in terms of where were we working? So if we look at just the physical space, uh, few people, 20% of people were working at home. 33% were working in the off, uh, sorry, in a hybrid fashion and 47% working in the office. That was pre-COVID. So there was already a movement towards hybrid working and working from home. Yeah, that's still 53% of people that were actually not working in this traditional sense of just in the office. Uh, February 2022, so a bit of a stake in the ground, we see that most people were still not returned to the office in February. We only had 4% of people in the office and most people working in a hybrid fashion um, as well as still a, a big chunk, 41% working at home. And where do people wanna go if they fast forward 12 months? Where would they like to be? 69% of people said they wanted to have a hybrid work environment with another 27% saying they want to work from home full time. Only 4% saying they want to return to the office full time. So there's this real need to think about how we help people to uh, or how we can accommodate people in this new environment. And I did want to just read this quote, which I thought was really important from the Slack CEO, Stuart Butterfield. The idea that everything's going to be exactly the same as it used to be, except we'll go to the office two days a week instead of five, really misses out on two fronts. From the employer side, we just won't have access to the broad base of talent that you have if you're more flexible. From the other side, let's say you have two competing job offers and they're similar in terms of the interest of the work, the compensation, the prestige and your belief in the company's mission or any other factors. One role says you have to be in the office five days a week and the other one says you can be in the office as much as you want to or need to. Who wouldn't take the second option? This is so important to think about. For I know that um, Kim's really going to be passionate and talking about retention and, and, and talent acquisition. This is such an important area to think about in terms of how we structure our workplaces moving forward. So dig into the research. It's really great. The other thing, though, is even looking at those average stats, be aware of those averages because we know that people are so diverse, the needs of people, even in this little snippet again, you know, for organisations, it can therefore be reasonably expected that the majority of workers, 74%, will look to work a minimum of three days from home. But then we go drown, drill down into the life stages. Millennials and Gen Xers want to work from home the most likely due to this cohort having the majority of carers' commitments and therefore benefiting from the increased flexibility, while Gen Z and baby boomers want more time in the office. So we're going to see a difference depending on life stage, all of the things that impact us in, in our lives. So really important to have a think about what we can do 
as HR professionals uh, to support our teams, our people in these spaces. I thought this was also a really lovely one. This is actually from the previous report I mentioned, just explaining you know, the needs, the flexibility, the way that people feel about working at home or in the office, the ability for us to feel flexible and also to feel that we're doing our best work and not necessarily just because we're sitting at our desk from nine to five. There's this need for a, a different way of thinking about an outcomes-based approach to work. And again, a little quote down here, actually from PwC. Uh, ben was one of the, was actually the major presenter uh, on Friday. Throughout the pandemic, we saw leaders get to know their people a lot better. They were more concerned about their mental health and the well-being of their team. We saw daily check-ins and very human conversations. It's important that we don't lose sight of this and just think of it as a COVID thing. We need to maintain this focus on well-being into the future. So, so true and so important. This is no longer just a, you know, it was a COVID thing. This is definitely the way of the future for most of us in terms of our working style. And I think this was a really interesting insight which came very much towards the end of the discussion. But the idea of mandates versus guidelines, the idea of people really needing some flexibility and leaders being able to experiment and, and, and really look at what's going to work moving forward. There was no, you know, we can't set a, a policy up and just say, that's it, we're done. We've got our hybrid working thing sorted. There's a need for experimentation and flex here. Because if you look at the, the yellow box on the left-hand side there, there are so many benefits from working from home that people are loving. The average commute saved that they talked about was 84 minutes. Imagine how much more we do with our 84 minutes. Most people are finding that it helps them to save money, obviously. There's a better work-life balance, more time with family and friends, more time for exercise, and for some, reduced stress and burnout. So if we want to support teams and help them to do their very best work, and to retain great staff, we need to be aware of these things. I thought the middle box, the pink box, was just a really important one, again, for us to think about. If an organisation mandates a forced return to the office, over a 29%, over a quarter, would quit their role, and another third would consider leaving. That's a huge challenge for us, a huge, huge challenge. I think that's one thing to be really aware of is just be, be prepared to experiment and flex with these changes is, is a really key one. And this one, there's a couple of things on here too, is the idea of enticement. There was some great discussion about the, the importance of cities and the importance of enticing people back into, the, into the, the city community and to support businesses in those communities but it needs to be for the right reasons. So being aware of why we want to work in the office, what we, what we can actually do there that's really productive and really important for us. So the opportunity to co-locate with your team to actually do work with your team that needs to be done face-to-face. -face. Coming together for the social aspects, for the connection and collaboration. This is really important and a, and a great one. I know that uh, Jen and Kim may have some, some thoughts on this one. Uh, some of the examples that were used on Friday, they were talking about having events, especially to draw people into the office, having cultural events or fundraising events to support community was really powerful. Things that people really want to come to the office for, make that happen. And the, the discussion around technology, we can access better advanced technology in the office than we can at home. And there are challenges there too, to think about how do we ensure that at home we are as productive because technology is, is there for us. I also thought this one was really important in terms of our well-being. The, the, the two little graphics on the side here on the, the right, specifically almost three quarters of respondents felt their well-being had improved with hybrid working. 42% strongly agreeing, with only 10% saying that it had gotten worse. Yet for those that have struggled with working from home, there were definitely these feelings, you know, 42% regularly experiencing loneliness and isolation. So there's a real need to get this balance. Another 31% feeling more stressed and burnt out. So we have to have some balance and focus here. 
28% have ex access to mental health and wellbeing support. So it's becoming a much more important part of our holistic wellbeing within the workplace. And obviously why we're so passionate about Ninja too, because we're really advocating for balance when it comes to productivity. We have to be careful of those that are finding that they, you know, we're no longer, what's the quote we, we use? Um, we're no longer uh, working from home. We're sleeping at the office. This idea that there's no disconnection time, there's no segmentation of a workday. So creating bookends, those kind of things are so important to encourage our teams to do. Have a start time, have a finish time. We call it create a fake commute. You know, so for you, Jen, I know working full time in Tassie now, you know, making that start in the day, putting on our work clothes and, and, and pretending we're off to the office is often what we need to get our brain engaged. So those kind of things can really be very helpful. The other big area which I'm really passionate about is the idea of harnessing leaders to ensure hybrid teams thrive. This is a really powerful part of the, the presentation and the research. And I think I just wanted to read this to you because this is really talking to some of the stuff we're going to get into in our uh, little uh, open mic session in, in our panel discussion. We need to train managers to lead hybrid teams. In the new hybrid working world, many leaders lack confidence and employees don't always feel trusted. Finally, a lot of the organisational drive and implementation for hybrid working rests with team leaders in the middle management. The complexity of their role has increased significantly. They're now responsible for the performance, well-being, and environment of their geographically dispersed team in an uncertain and ambiguous operating context. These team leaders are critical for future success and essential in making hybrid working work, warranting an uplift in support from the organisation. But many have never been upskilled to develop the capability to fulfil these responsibilities effectively, the impact of which has exacerbated in recent times. I think it talks really well to the challenges that now leaders are facing within organisations. I'm going to hope that we're going to have a big, big, deep discussion on this one in a second. So I'd love to just pause just for a couple of minutes and ask you to have a think about what you can personally take away from these insights. I'll just recap those on the screen for you there. I'll just give you two minutes to have a think about that, maybe jot down a couple of notes. What can you personally take away from these insights? What would be useful for you to take back to your organisation? And if you have any aha moments, please put them in the chat box. Okay, I hope that was a good little couple of minutes just to think that through. Jolanda, yeah, investing more in our leaders and giving them the tools, empowering them. Yeah, it's critical, isn't it? Very, very important. Any other insights, anything else anyone would like to share? Feel free to, if you'd like to unmute yourself and have a chat with us, we'd love to hear your thoughts too, if you'd prefer to chat rather than pop in the text box. Okay. Well, we're going to get straight into our panel discussion, our open mic with Kim and Jen. So Kim and Jen, I would love to invite you to unmute yourself and join the discussion. First up, I thought I would throw to maybe Kim first. How is hybrid currently playing out for your organisation? Maybe if you could give us a little bit of a feel for how that's looking. Morning, everyone. I do this just as I'm about to cough. So excuse me <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, and I'm just seeing a couple of things in the chat that might be good to talk about too. But yes. Julie, I don't know whether it's easier. I think for the sake of the people on the call, um, I just wanted to share that we're an advertising group, a global advertising group made up of multiple agencies. So, uh, you know, the joy and the tension that happens in our hybrid model is each of our businesses can choose to do things a little bit differently. So we really try and make our brands work best for the cult the, for their cultures 
Um, and in Australia, we're spread over five markets. Um, so cap cities except for Adelaide. So that includes Canberra. So again, you've got really different dynamics that occurred during COVID in each of those places. So in fact, their momentum or interest or approach to hybrid changed a lot based on their market and the state health requirements. So I think that's just a, I hope that's a, a helpful bit of context as I start to talk. Um, so how we're approaching hybrid is um, with a global approach that we introduced, which I think is absolutely brilliant. It's probably so brilliant, it's not that useful. <laughs> But I, I want to share a little bit because what just came up then with the PwC insights was it, this model, and we launched it in July last year in prepare, you know, in preparation for coming back to the office. Um, it already started to factor in a lot of those things that PwC talked about. So the role of the office, what the leader's role were, making sure we made it very individual and, and consultative. Um, so... And, and, and very human, I suppose. But if I can just explain the model. So we call it better way, meaning we see this as a future model. It wasn't just a fix for how we would just come through COVID. And um, we we didn't set it as a policy. We set it as a way to, to encourage consultation across each of our businesses, brands, teams, markets around the world to say, how do you want to work? And... Please, if you want to think about how you want to work, here's a couple of guidelines for you. So, for instance, we suggested you should be in as much as you're out, but not on a regular basis. So don't make it a weekly thing. Think about it across, you know, a year or something. Make it purposeful. Here are some um, indicators for what purpose could look like. And we bucketed it into what we called the four C's because we're built around clients. So that was a big thing. Community matters to us, so how our teams run. People's careers is a huge driver for us. So as Julie said, retention is a massive um, area for us always, but even more so during COVID and post COVID. Um, and care, that well-being factor that PwC shared. You know, we certainly really wanted to build um, purpose around that. And we gave each team a model or a framework that said sit together and consult. And we gave them tools on how to do that. And we said, what are the things you must come in for? What are the things you should come in for? And what are the things you could do away from, you know, from the office? And so that's what I'm thinking. It's beautiful and brilliant. But in reality, as humans, we all diverted to, let's just come in three days a week. <laughs> so... So that's sort of my wrap up of a beautiful concept, a really flexible, agile model, really sort of tailored to our teams and our people and our clients. And in reality, humans like the, 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 the routine or the boundaries that help them establish success. And later on, I can talk about what some of the risks are, but I think I hope that's a good explanation of where we're at for hybrid. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, Kim. That's, that's a great synopsis of, of where things are at. Wonderful. Thank and Jen, you. Jen's just started a new role. So I think Jen's going to have an interesting perspective working now completely at home, um, but maybe contrasting that even with your previous role. Thanks, Jen. Absolutely. Thanks. And I was just reflecting before on what you were saying about saving 84 minutes of every day in the commute. And I think I've spent most of that catching up on sleep, which has been amazing. So I need to get back into my exercise routine. Um, but I might take a lead from Kim and actually just give you a very quick rundown of what Lendy Group is, um, for those that don't know. Um, Lendy Group was basically born last year. Um, so they're only one year old. Um, they are a merge of two powerhouse brands, which were Lendy, uh, which is a startup tech company um, in an online home mortgage broking uh, platform. And Aussie Home Loans, which you'll probably be familiar with, quite an, a strong Australian brand. So those two brands merged last year um, and became Lendy Group. I've been with Lendy Group for, this is the beginning of my second week, so really brand new into the role. Um, previously, I was working for state government down in Tasmania here for a short time. Um, 
Unfortunately, the agency was abolished recently. And so that's what put me back on the market. And one of the key things that I was looking for as an individual was a hybrid working situation. Um, it really surprised me the amount of organisations out there that still didn't offer that in their job ads. Um, you know, some I spoke to and they said, you know, we might consider it for the right type of person or the right type of role that we're looking for. But many weren't still in that space, which was quite surprising to me. Lucky for me, Lindy Group was. Uh, and their approach to hybrid um, working is simply, they call it flexed first. Flex first, which means you do you, basically. Anywhere in Australia, wherever you want to be located is entirely up to you. You can work from home. You can have a hybrid working situation. You can condense your hours. You can flex however you want to flex to make sure that you're balancing your needs um, in the best possible way. So that was quite a challenge for the organisation, um, as I understand it, because the two brands coming together posed quite different cultures and quite different ways of working. Um, the Aussie side was very traditional in the office and had, you know, sort of said they wanted their people back in the office three days, uh, whereas the Lendy side of the business had been a lot more flexible. So bringing those two together has been uh, quite a challenge in itself. And we are still working through some of the nuts and bolts on, on how that plays out for everybody now. But that's a very quick overview of how I've yeah. come into this particular situation and what Lendy Group is doing. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Jen. That's a really interesting um, perspective on things, looking at it from very much that, you know, when you were looking for a role, how did it fit? Yeah, and I've heard the same thing. I'm working with a couple of people that are looking for new roles at the moment. And, yeah, they're struggling to find organisations that will fit what their needs are. So, yeah, very interesting. Um, I did also just want to go back to the chat box just quickly. Marie was just mentioning rethinking the role of the office far more productive at home and looking, re-looking at what we gain from going back to the office. Um, I would really encourage Marie, have a look at the report from PwC. There's lots and lots on um, great office setup, kind of they've, they've really gone through looking at how, how the future of offices are gonna look and the kinds of activities that we should be doing in the office space. So have a look at that one. But the, the context of kind of where we are currently, we can see, I think even with those brief discussions, um, how flexible we need to be and how things are potentially going to change. Uh, and maybe I know Kim was saying, you know, as human beings, we just go, well, I'll just do three days. It's kind of our default when things are overwhelming and stressful. And we're not kind of sure where we want to end up. Um, so if we're going to need to lead, I guess, our people through these things. OK, I'm going to go to the second question. What elements of hybrid working do you and your leaders most worry about? Kim, shall I go to you first? Hello again. Um, mm. So the leaders, they, you know, if I if I stand back a bit from what hybrid um, environments have also brought about is people's choice to go somewhere else or to not work. So we've we've seen probably a doubling of people leaving the industry without future roles to go to. So we've got what normally might be a 6% vacancy in our industry now at a 12%. So what our leaders worry about is how do we keep talent? How do we attract talent and using hybrid to do so? So they think that hybrid is a, is, is a key um, to it. So how do you make sure that you're promoting the benefits of an office, the benefits of a team, but also setting a little bit of a standard around how the team has chosen to operate and then making sure that the, the person has the, as Jen said it in such a lovely way, how do they do them? You know, what are the, are they a caregiver? Are they doing things that matter to them in the morning? Are they, do they have to travel a huge distance? How do we start to factor that in and allow um, flex around the individual? So, I don't think you can win in all of those spaces, however. So I think that if we're just trying to tick across that range, it will help us for a little bit, but eventually it won't serve us. So I don't think our leaders are necessarily getting their head into that space just yet, 
because they're just so focused on, we'll do anything we need to bring in talent and to retain talent. So that's just one point. The thing that's starting to become evident is loss of skill. So we're a team-based business. So we build our teams around the IP of our clients, brands and marketing. We upskill pretty much on the job. And what we have started to see is a loss of skill and comfort with growth for a younger set of people who are starting out their careers, which is the bulk of our workforce. So I think that social learning or that capacity to find ease of learning and support from when you come together in a work environment in the office is, is probably something that they're starting to notice. I wouldn't say they're worried about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and the, and the third point is we've consolidated our, consolidated our real estate over the last two years because we don't need as much office space anymore. But now they worry about how do they bring their full teams together on the rare occasions that they do. So you start to bring in quite practical um, Mm. points too. And we've got this really fascinating situation in our Sydney office at the moment where we've really um, shortened our footprint in real estate and the amount of discussion around how many desks we need to have in the office. So on the rare occasion that we have teams in, I think has Um, traded on this amazing opportunity to redesign the role of the office Mm. you know if you're thinking about how do you if if we've designed a concept called better way we're all about purpose we're about coming together as teams important collaborative work hosting our clients hosting our media partners and all of a sudden you walk in and you see a whole lot of white empty desks Mm. and we haven't had as many meeting spaces redesigned or more collaborative opportunities or more sort of range or clubhouses everyone sort of talks about stuff I think we've really missed a trick on that and I think we'll worry about that after we've done the redesign and might have to invest a little bit more so they're the they're the three so Mm. retention and offering flex for the individual uh you know, making sure that we're upskilling people and understanding that a lot of learning comes from in intact team social learning or cross collaborative learning, and then eventually, um, you know, the the functionality or sort of the practicality of what they they're holding mm-hmm. on to in the past versus what teams and offices should provide now. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks. That's great, Kim. It, absolutely. Yeah, those top three. Powerful stuff. Thank you. Jen, do you have a perspective on this? What would you say to leaders? I know it's only two weeks in, but your perspective maybe even again from your previous roles or, or where you are now? Definitely, and I totally agree with Kim. The retention piece is, is huge. Um, I think, you know, the people leaders that I speak to or have spoken to over the last couple of years particularly um, are concerned about engagement. So how do I engage my people remotely and how do I keep them connected to purpose or how do I help them be productive and and share those ways of working and create those operating rhythms so I think that's definitely something that people are still working through Um, and I'll address the elephant in the room and call out the trust element as well I think we learned a massive lesson um, you know at the beginning of COVID where people leaders were forced to to really trust their people Um, and take away that control element. But I do still think that there is room that needs to be improved there. I think we've still got leaders that work in that very traditional sense, um, which is why we're seeing some of these organisations pushing people to come back into the office because they need people to be visible so that they can see that they're engaged. So I I do think that's still a burning platform um, as well. Um, The other thing I'd say is probably relationship building. I know a lot of leaders that I've spoken to are concerned about how to bring their people in and, you know, maintain those or build those relationships remotely, Um, which, you know, I've I've done a couple of times now over the past couple of years, and it's definitely a different way of working, but I think you can actually build even richer relationships virtually in a way because you open people up to your world a lot more um, as well. Mm, agree, Jen. I think that's a, such an important one, that relationship piece. And and I know they discussed this on Friday too. Don was really passionate about the, the fact that technology assists us now to help with this connection piece and making sure that we can create relationships that are meaningful. So, yeah, awesome. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to whiz on. I know it's a great discussion. I'm going to whiz us to the next question. I guess I'd love to know, how are you supporting your people right now? And if you've got any creative thinking there, again, this unorthodoxy, the idea of what you've experimented with, what's, what's helping to support people a little differently that you think is quite unique to your organisation. Um, I'll keep going with the back and forth. Kim, how about you? <laughs> and Julie, you're talking around hybrid and how they work from home sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I probably draw a bit of a blank on the unorthodoxy, even though we probably do unorthodox very well in advertising. Um, so, I mean, during the pandemic, we we were so concerned for our people, the way that we supported them and br brought in virtual sessions and give you know lots of gift and rewards and um, care and recognition. So that happened. I think we have never had to ask people or the HR department so often for people's home addresses so we can send out lovely little perks and, you know, um, and elements like that. So I think we did that fairly well. Um, certainly when we launched Better Way to do hybrid, we gave the manager toolkit to absolutely everybody. We did full transparency around the things to discuss, explore together so that each person could work out that we supported them and then we, we were very open to them. And knowing that framework is very formal, I think where we've got to now is a really comfortable space of recognition around people come in and work when they need to and we really feel like we've supported them well at home. So if people don't want to come in, they don't have to come in. Uh, we make sure that if we hear of anything that um, you know, that we're concerned about. We make sure that the offer of physical is just as much available virtually and anything that we offer our people has a blend. So if we do something in person, we'll also do it offline. Sometimes we'll do it both. I mean, we do, we do have some tech concerns. Um, I wonder whether most companies still experience that. I still go, I was in Sydney a couple of weeks ago for a meeting and we had someone dial in from Melbourne and the experience for them was just horrendous. You still can't, if you've got 10 people in a, a, a meeting room and then you've got someone offline, it's still pretty weak. And I think they're the things that we could get better at. So I don't feel like we're doing radical things. I think we're being very logical around and practical around how we offer support. Uh, the one thing we've really amped up broadly through media brands, and I would say this doesn't matter, um, you know, or doesn't really necessarily affect hybrid is just the impact of the pandemic was we've never offered so much wellbeing product. So we've never offered so much around for the individuals, we've never promoted wellbeing in a stronger way. We do stuff on a regional level, locally. We do counselling walk-in sessions every month. We have never promoted our EAP as much as we have. We've offered resilience learning. Um, you know, we, we do lots of individual support for people if we've got concerns for them. So that's sort of caring for the individual. Um, no. I think the biggest gap for us around support is what I've been hearing from our people is this aspect of trust that Jen mentioned. I don't think our leaders yet recognise that the reason some people aren't returning to a team environment is because the autonomy they get at home, the absolute freedom they get, which doesn't come up on that list that PwC, like they're very, very, you know, important measurable elements about cost and flex and everything. But when you speak to people who can run their day as they wish to run their day, that means that they can, they should be able to do that here in our office and yet mm. they feel like they can't. Yeah. So I think that's the next step in support. How do you empower people to not just bed into a three-day a week? Because that's very shortly going to not feel like flex. Yeah. You know, if they still have to be in here on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because they've chosen that as a team, um, how and then feeling like they have to be in here on the dot of nine I was just like we've got to eradicate that and actually the leaders are starting to pick up on some poor throwaway lines that they realize are not supporting flex so you know uh, you know are you going already or you, you know that funny joke are you having half a day or where have you mm. been or you know so we're trying to promote this leave loudly or arrive loudly mm -hmm. sort of scenario, but you need <laughs> leaders to model that and you need to make sure that people can recognise that work will happen on the commute or with a gap once they log back in at home. The work 
definitely is getting done. We've got no issue with work productivity. So how do we support the emotional empowerment and the autonomy of our people to come in and out and act almost as consultants as they do at home? Mm, wonderful. Yeah, that's really powerful, Kim. Thank you. Um, the trust piece is one I'm going to touch on uh, in a second too. Okay. I think it is absolutely critical um, for us to, to imbue that culture with trust and actually build it. It's, it's, it's so important. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Jen, perspectives. I think um, we're not really doing anything out of the ordinary as well, I don't think, at the moment. Um, one thing I have seen that they did do a lot of work in over the last sort of six months or so was really focusing in on psychological safety in the workplace remotely and in the office. So what does that look like in teams? How do you build trust in teams? How do you have that healthy conflict um, and how do you maintain that productivity and the commitment and achieve results? So Patrick Lencioni's five cohesions of a, uh, well, five layers of a cohesive team, I think it is. Um, so really supporting people and helping them understand what works for them and also giving them permission to, to Kim's point before, we're all sort of working hybrid and remotely at the moment. So we need permission to manage our calendars and our days the best that we absolutely can for us. So if you need to have a two hour block in the middle of the day to go and do something, whatever that is, then you can do that. And then you can jump online later on and finish what your work is. But also balancing the perspective of not sitting on the computer late at night and just sneaking a peek at Teams and just seeing if there's anything that's come through. You know, that's almost the new managing your media diet during COVID. Now you have to manage your Teams diet as well. Yeah. So I think though that's a really important part. The other thing that they are doing um, at the moment with the Flex First guidelines at Lendy Group is reimagining what it looks like for each individual from an onboarding perspective. So having a think about what the benefits package might look like if, for example, I'm working 100% remotely, what does that look like for me? And what um, scenarios will play out in terms of me going to get office equipment or IT equipment or things like that? And how do I make that easy for myself and rather than waiting for someone to send it down to me? And then for someone that's going into the office, what does it look like for them? So really thinking about what that individual perspective is uh, to make sure that they can be productive and also a well-being. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, that's, it's every layer of our organisation, isn't it, that we need to touch on and, and put this perspective over. So, yeah, awesome. Thank you for that. Okay, my last question for the panel what and this kind of obviously leads us into me talking about productivity because I think that's an important facet that we want to bring to the hybrid discussion is what do you think will be the game changers to improve hybrid productivity I know for lots of us it's great but how can we make it even better what would be your wish list Kim? New tech which I said much better office design <laughs> how to build the trust that I just talked about with our people um yeah. And I think a much broader view on where the office is. So at the moment, we still require our people to be in a commutable distance to meet with clients. And I just think, while well, we're so troubled by talent, how do we totally unlock that? So I'd love to go and live in Tassie, Jen. So like, how <laughs> could I do my job there? Um, yeah, those type of a lot more relaxed around it and really celebratory of the successes um, would be marvellous. And, you know, mm -hmm. that to me brings in the opportunity to hire really different talent and really promote being family friendly and all the sort of things that we should. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. That was a very good, quick, concise and brilliant list. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, how about you? Any wishes on productivity? I guess you, you've experienced oh. some of our ninja workshops. So I'd love your perspective on, you know, what works well in hybrid and what would you want more of? Definitely. I'm all across the ninja. Um, the first thing I touched on it before was onboarding. So I think onboarding is one of those things that people think that they do pretty well. But I think onboarding in a, in a remote or hybrid situation is absolutely critical. And you can't underestimate the experience that that will have on people. 
Um, so I think we really need to get that right and, and synthesize that. The other thing I'd say is digital literacy. Um, we've sort of spoken about technology and tech stacks and how we use that. I think we quite often assume that people know when they're joining an organization what technology is used for what purpose. You know, so to help productivity, what do we use Teams for? What do we use Slack for? What do we, you know, what's our cadence of meetings? You know, all those kinds of things. So really helping people to understand rather than fumble their way through it when they begin, um, I think. And we touched on it a little bit earlier, reimagining what that office experience looks like. So for somebody that joins 100% remotely, what is that cadence for them coming up into the office? For me, um, it might be a quarterly trip up to Sydney, um, hopefully get a little bit of shopping done, um, you know, but that, how do we balance that out? And for people that are coming into the office, as you said before, let's give them a purpose to come in. Let's just not think, well, oh, this is my day in the office this week, and then I turn up and there's no one there, you know, so we've got to plan these things out a little bit better, I think. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much. I think that was an awesome discussion. Um, there were a couple of comments in the chat box, which I've just been monitoring. Thank you, Gavin. You've, you've captured a few of the beautiful thoughts there in the discussion. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to just really quickly, I'm just conscious of time. Oh, time just flies when we're doing these things. I'm going to whiz through some top tips for uh, hybrid productivity that I think are really important that maybe add to the conversation, maybe build on it slightly um, before we get into some just action planning for you guys. So here are my top tips. We talked about knowing our team and knowing them intimately. You know, what are our team really good at? Ensuring that we know their talents, their skills, their strengths, really ensuring that we, we have that intimate level of conversation, uh, I think is absolutely key for productivity so that we know when we're allocating as leaders, you know, tasks, projects, we know who is going to be the best person for that role. I think this is a really key one from a productivity perspective. And we're going to get into the conversation on trust. What if I can't see them? This has been such a big thing that we hear when we're talking about productivity is, is building trust, understanding that sitting at their desk, we talk about this a lot in our workshops. When we, we do run some hybrid working workshops and especially for leaders as well. How do you know they're doing what they're supposed to be doing even when they are sitting at that desk? So we need to start building some trust as leaders in our teams. And this comes from that idea of, you know, we, we want to move away on this spectrum of, of reactivity and being focused as leaders on reacting to what we see and being much more proactive and setting clear vision and strategy so that our teams know what's expected of them. I guess we talk a lot about it moving from a very much a location-based uh, focus. So, you know, I'm sitting in the office and I'm being productive to very much an outcome-based culture ones that can actually deliver great results without having to be sat at a desk from nine till five or eight till seven or whenever it is that our team leaders are sitting there. It's so really thinking that through. And building this culture of trust is so critical. This is our organisational lubricant. This is what makes our cultures work really, really well and encourages people to want to come and work for us. That retention piece is so key here. We talk about this as the Goldilocks moment to the Goldilocks control kind of point. If you think about as leaders, we need to really unlock this idea of trust and being able to encourage our team to know that we, be we believe in them, we trust them, that we know they have the skills and the talents. To move away from the micromanagement, there's obviously going to be some need for potentially that when we're onboarding or we've got new team members. But then how do we make sure that in the remote spaces that teams are not feeling completely abandoned? And this is where we see that idea of isolation and, and loneliness coming through. So that Goldilocks moment, can we identify that as leaders? And being emotionally aware, emotionally intelligent enough to find out what that is for each of our individual team members is really key. And this is one from Brené Brown, this idea of building trust. It's like putting a marble in a jar. Yeah, when we're building trust, it's just one marble at a time, one little thing that we can do to build trust. And I'm, I'm just going to pause for a second and get you to think about what can you do to build trust every day? It could be the conversations that we have. It could be the admission of, you know, oops, I made a mistake. The little things that we do build trust. 
And sometimes the issue for us as leaders is that, you know, when we lose trust, we're taking a whole big handful of marbles out of that jar. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to rebuild. So it's really important that we do have this focus on trust. Another big one for me is for us as leaders to pick the right things. And I'm going to um, just really encourage you to think about for you as a leader, you've got way too much to do. Yeah. There's so much that you could be doing. And this is one of our ninjas over in the UK, Grace Marshall, trying to get everything done will ruin your productivity. It's so much more important that we focus on the right things. We also need to realise that we live in an interruption heavy environment. And that, again, takes us back to that reactive state. We react more, we get less done. So it's very important that we do select the right channels, the right communication strategies to help us get stuff done. We've been doing heaps of Supercharger Team Comms workshops where we create a comms manifesto for teams because right now this is so key. When do you use your mobile phone texting? When do you use Teams direct message chats? When do you use channels? When do you use Slack? You know, all of these technologies can create just more confusion. So we have to be really clear on that in order to be able to limit interruptions. I know I'm whizzing fast, but I want to get this out for you. The other thing that we need to do is to really focus on impact, the 80-20 rule. If you guys know about the Pareto principle, this was Mendel with his P experiments. I talk about this. I love this one in the workshops is we need to focus on the 20% that's going to give us our 80% of our results, 80% of our impact. So really focusing on that as leaders is key, not sweating the small stuff. And this one's I'm really passionate about. We've got a new workshop I'm just about to launch called Delegate Like a Ninja. Uh, we actually have a little uh, ninja skill booster coming up at the end of the month if you'd like to know more, more about this one. But this is about creating an organisation of leaders and thinkers. So empowering our teams to think really well is key. And if we're great as leaders at delegating, this really is going to make a difference to our behaviours within the hybrid environment too. Delegation will help free up your time to focus on the things that matter, to focus on outcomes. It gives us a growth mindset, improving our skills and our development, and it helps to establish this culture of trust. So I'd really encourage you to think about, have you empowered your leaders to delegate well, to understand the power of delegation? This is such an important concept. I love this little graphic. When I said you should up security, I meant put a latch on the door. You know, as leaders, we need to be clear about our delegation and have a shared vision of what the outcomes must be. And again, that Goldilocks moment, the control, how much freedom can I give my team in order that they can get effective work done? And I know that they're on track. So being really clear on how much we want to delegate. So we have come to the point where I would love to just pop you into some chat rooms for a few minutes, just to have a quick chat about all of the concepts that we've talked about today. We are very short on time. I'm so sorry. We have run over with our gorgeous discussions, but let's just very quickly jump into some chat rooms. I'm just going to set out the breakout rooms really quickly and easily. If I can, where did my breakout rooms go? Oh, there they are. Awesome. I'm going to automatically assign everyone to breakout room. We have... I'm going to just set up three rooms and I am going to also just, uh, yeah, I'm going to let Kim and Jen go to those rooms too. I think that will be fun so that you can have some discussion with Jen and Kim as well, if that's okay. Uh, and, yeah, I will come back to you. I'm just going to give you a few minutes and, yeah, go for it. Chat rooms are opening now. What actions can you take?
Hi there, Karen, you've joined me again. Thanks for coming back. Did you get kicked out? No. No, sorry, I, I had to go and do something else and come back. But if you finish, oh. then that's fine. No, no, they're just in a chat room. They're about to come back and we're just going to do a quick wrap up. So if you want to have that's the bit I really wanted anyway. So that's exciting. And thank oh. you very much. And I'll watch no the rest of the recording that I missed. Lovely. Thank you so much for joining us, thank Karen. You. I hope it was useful. Yeah, yeah, good. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. I'll send out some resources as well after the session. Great. The rooms are just about to come back now. Where are, where are they? Are they coming back? Here we go. Lovely. I'm sorry those rooms were so short. I'm sure you could have talked all day on this topic, but thank you. Thank you for coming back. Um, I will just quickly wrap us up though, because I do want to get you out of here on time. You're probably back to back. So hopefully maybe some of you are actually going off for lunch now, but please keep in touch. We are running a lot of workshops around hybrid working at the moment for productivity and wellbeing. So please get in touch if there's anything that you need. Um, our next Ninja Skill Booster I mentioned is on the 31st of May. Um, I'll include a link to that in the email that I send you after the session if you'd like to send anyone along to talk about delegation that's a great one for leaders um, and also if you have anyone that needs specifically some help around productivity and well-being we have our six weeks to ninja program starting on the 2nd of June that's a great six-week program for those that really need some sort of in-depth help so please feel free to send them our way and thank you a big thank you to Kim and Jen it looks like Kim's had to go um, but thank you so much for joining us they, that was really wonderful to have you really appreciate you making the time here are my details again uh, keep talking to us we love talking this stuff we know we're nerds but thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day thank you Sonia thanks Marie take care thanks Julie if anyone well, wants Julie, to thanks, have a chat no worries, I'm going to stop the recording.